Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Unemployed Millennial Podcast. I am your host, Anne Marie, and I am excited to announce that this full video and all the full episodes of the video podcasts are now on YouTube. I have made the decision to make the switch. So you can now find all these videos on YouTube if you're listening on audio. And if you're currently watching the YouTube video, you can see that got some nice cozy vibes in Alaska. So today my guest is Elliot Biznow, who is the founder of Summit, co-founder of Summit. This episode was actually recorded back in October, 2022. And I'm actually quite glad that I held off posting it because I was actually able to attend a summit event in November 11th through 14th in Palm Desert. And I have to say, since attending that event, it was a little bit life-changing. And I think it is kind of the start to a domino effect of other things that will come on this podcast and even on my YouTube channel. So I think that this will be a really cool episode because it's kind of a checkpoint And there's just like a lot of overlap somehow with Elliot Biznow in kind of the circles that I'm in. So I'm sure this will also not be the last time that his name will be mentioned on this podcast. So Elliot Biznow is the co-founder of Summit and he recently co-founded, co-wrote a book called Make No Small Plans. I actually got my hands on this book after attending the first creator camp, which he is actually mentoring the CEO of Creator Camp, Chris Duncan, who connected me with Elliot Biznow. I only mention Chris in this podcast because that's our connection, but I also want to give a shout out to the other Creator Camp founders, co-founders, Max, Eli, Simon, and Ryan, because I did not mention them in this podcast, and they are also co-founding Creator Camp. So Summit based on my experience, was a fascinating weekend filled with fascinating people. Truly, anytime we sat down next to someone and had a conversation with them, they were some of the most interesting people that we have talked to, that I've met. It was kind of a TEDx meets culinary experience meets music festival. There was, it was kind of my dream come true because I love podcasts and I literally listened, I have listened to some of the speakers for years before being able to see them in person speak at uh, Summit. For example, Esther Perel, I often talk about omens and she was the first person who kind of put that idea into my head. Who else was there? Paul Stamets, that was a really fascinating uh, talk by Paul Stamets. Jim Quick, he spoke at USC as well as Alex Benayan, I also saw him speak at USC in like 2017 when I was attending school there. So just a fascinating event and filled with really brilliant minds and people at the top of their fields. So I had an incredible experience at Summit and we don't get that much into his business success, but he also, Elliot also has a lot of success in other areas outside of just community building. For example, he was able to buy the largest ski resort in America by his mid twenties. And it was $40 million alongside his co-founders and this huge community that he has built along the way, hosting these events. He initially started Summit just because he wanted to connect with peers that were entrepreneurs that were building cool things on their own. And he kind of says that Everyone is building on an island, but he looked out and saw that there were other islands. And so he kind of wanted to build this community so that it wasn't such a lonely journey and a lot has come from it. And my friends with Creator Camp are doing the same thing with the creator space. And I think it's a fascinating time because I think that the creator space is kind of the startup era of this generation. His book, Make No Small Plans, I got at Creator Camp. It was in our goodie bag. And this was truly the first book that I have read that kind of just shows the impacts of community building and where it can lead you. Because I've always had this strong intuition that community is very important. I've spent a lot of, I spent a lot of my time trying to build community wherever I am, whether it's in Anchorage, Alaska or in the YouTube spaces. I think it's invaluable, but I've never really been able to put a tangible value or story 
maybe just because it hasn't happened yet, but make no small plans actually shows the kind of tangible impacts of building this community. For example, with his purchase of Powder Mountain for $40 million based on building these events. Um, So his book is fascinating. I'll link it in the show notes and the YouTube description box. Uh, I think his story is fascinating. And we go into a lot of talks about community building, about hosting events, and also just about working with other people. He co-founded Summit with three other people. So there are four of them. And has obviously had a lot of experience working with other people, which is something that I think is fascinating. So I've asked him a lot of questions about that. So I hope you enjoy this podcast with Elliot Biznow. I'm here with Elliot Biznow, who is the founder of Summit Series. And I'm going to go through kind of my story to kind of introduce why I'm so excited to be talking to you right now. Great. Here we go. I'm excited too. So I know of you because I attended this camp called Creator Camp. And the person who hosted that camp was named Chris Duncan. And he gave us this book. And after I read this book, I realized how closely he modeled Creator Camp after kind of what you started doing with Summit Series. So Creator Camp was this camp for I guess influencers, social influencers, or just kind of anyone who creates on any platform. There were 31 creators and we all got together five hours outside of Denver, Colorado. And we had like a three day, four day experience and it was amazing. And the reason why I agreed to go is because I know that anytime you get a group of creators together, I think I like to call it synchronicity, like synchronicity happens. And my kind of experience and why I'm so interested in talking to you, because I've actually never heard of a story like yours, but I feel like there are so many like kind of like third door stories, but never about building a community. Going back like whatever, 16 years ago, was there a moment in hosting these events that you kind of realized there's a lot of magic and power in just events? What was that thought process early on? Well, I definitely did not get invited to any events growing Mm. up. And I did not get invited to any events in college. I would have to kind of work my way to get into anything. And then when I started a business in college and I wanted to build the business, I didn't have any events to go to. And I think that was really a function that I was, you know, 20 years old, 21, 22 years old. And so the original reason I wanted to start Summit is Mm -hmm. that I did not have a community kind of you know, when you went to your first ever event where there were other YouTubers there and you thought, wow, you know, it seems like we should all know each other Mm -hmm. because we're all, you know, creating content and there's so much overlap, but in fact, we're all in different parts of the world. And so a great event to me is about getting together all the people that you should have been friends with, if not for, you know, happenstance that you just live in all these different cities. So I had the idea, you know, I'm not getting invited to the TED conference. I'm not getting invited to anything. And I really want to meet other entrepreneurs. And so my only way to do that is that I literally had to cold call people. And I would read like Inc. Magazine or Entrepreneur Magazine. And I'd find these little, you know, paragraph highlights of, of this, you know, guy who started a new shoe company. That was Tom Shoes. This is, you know, like 15 years ago, 12 yeah. years ago. And I would cold call them. And I would say, hey, you know, I also have a startup and I want to get together with other entrepreneurs. Would you want to do that? And, you know, it only works to cold call people if they are your peers. Mm. So if you're a YouTuber with 2000 subscribers, Mm -hmm. you can probably cold call or cold reach out to people, email, message, someone with DM with 3000 subscribers or 5000. Yeah. But it probably wouldn't work to DM uh, Mr. Beast. Yeah. Or someone with millions of subscribers. So you kind of need to, you know, build your own peer group and start with people who really are your peers. And at the beginning of Summit, all these people really were at the beginning of their journeys. The, you know, the folks who, you know, started Airbnb and Zappos and, um, you know, and Uber and so many Shopify, like wow. these people came when I either before they started those businesses or like in the first year. And they also didn't have peers. So one thing we did not do was 
cold reach out to people or really try to reach out to people who are, you know, you know, decades older than us mm -hmm. and way more successful than us. Like we really built the community from the ground up. How old were you when you started the first event at the? I was 22. Okay. I was listening to, I think, a podcast with you on it that you mentioned you had to socially calibrate. Can you speak more on that? And you were also were known kind of as the sales pitch. Casino uh, floor Casino Elliot. floor Elliot. Yeah, when I was in high school, I had two friends. Mm. I think that's probably pretty normal for a lot of kids in high school, but I had like two friends, they were like stretch friends. Um, <laughs> and so I think, you know, part of that is because, you know, you're growing up and you're trying to find yourself. Um, but I was definitely not in any clique or group of big, a big, awesome group of friends and we were all rocking it on the weekends. And so then when I went to college, I had a couple new friends. Um, I, I really was driven, like I had a lot of energy. I think the social calibration part is like I was excitable. I, you know, well, I knew I wanted to build, you know, my dream and be an entrepreneur pretty quickly in college. Like mm -hmm. I got to college and my parents didn't give me any money. So I was so broke that it would, I was in Madison, Wisconsin at the University of Wisconsin and it was like zero degrees or negative five and I would walk five blocks just to not pay a $2 ATM fee. Mm. And I was getting $20 out at a time from the ATM. And I was like eating just terrible food. Like I was just eating pasta with butter and salt. Like that oh was like my main food. Yeah. Um, and I just realized, I think in those moments, I'm like, this sucks. Mm. And I'm, I'm grateful, you know, my parents like, you know, many folks who are lucky, like if you come from a, any kind of middle-class home, like you have food in the refrigerator, nice place to sleep at night. And so I had that, but they like really cut me off when I went to college mm -hmm. and I really was in the real world. Mm. And, uh, and so I didn't, I couldn't buy anything at stores. Um, and I just, I kind of realized like I'd really, you know, need to, I really need to, you know, make my own luck, make my way in the world. And at the same time, I was on the tennis team and the kids who had been seniors the year before I arrived, they had, they, they came back to visit and I said, Oh, how's being out in the real world? And they were like, it's horrible. Do not go there. I'm like, where? They're like the real world. They're like, it's horrible. I'm like, what do you mean? Yeah. Isn't it exciting? I thought we keep moving forward. They're like, no, like my job sucks. My life sucks. I'm in this like, shoebox apartment, I don't have any money, I'm working like 110 hour weeks, oh like all these people are bossing me around and treating me like, you know, like I'm just like some runt. I'm like, what do you mean? You're the, you're the star of the team. You, you, I, you're my hero. Mm. I looked up to you and now you're the bottom, they're like just, they're like, just my advice, trust me, just stay in college as long <laughs> as you can. And I think it was like, the fact that I had no money and the fact I saw like a ticking time bomb, like if you leave college and you are unprepared, yeah, you're gonna have a really tough go of it in the mm -hmm. real world. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of realized over those few months, like I need to get a grip on things. I need to take control of my life. And if you, you know, have interests or things you're passionate about or excited about or you like doing, it's really hard to find a job that perfectly fits your interests. Yeah. Like if you're obsessed with uh, with anything, making a certain type of content, mm -hmm. like it's gonna be hard to find a job making the type of content you like. They may be like, oh, you have a content skills. Uh, I want you to make, uh, you know, pitch videos for our, you know, used car lot that yeah. sells, you know, Hondas. And you're like, wait, what? Yeah. I wanna make, and, you know, that that's just the reality. Mm -hmm. And so I started realizing, you know, I think I'm gonna need to, you know, do something entrepreneurial. And I met this person uh, who was the first entrepreneur I'd ever met. And they were the RA, the resident advisor in our dorm. Mm -hmm. So they, that meant they were supposed to kind of look out for the kids in the dorm. And they were, you know, 25 or 26 and they had a screen printing press in their dorm room mm -hmm. and they were screen printing t-shirts and I went to them I said oh wow like you're screen printing t-shirts with funny slogans like who hired you 
They're like, nobody hired me. I'm like, what do you mean nobody hired you? Like, then how are you doing it? He's like, I have my own business. And like, I'm the RA of the dorm. And so the university covers, uh, or the, the, the dorm, this gave, that gives me free food and free mm -hmm. housing. And then I still have 12 grand a year in tuition costs or whatever it was. And he's like, I make a thousand bucks a month screen printing t-shirts. I'm like, right, but who's your boss? He's like, no, I like saved 300 bucks. I bought a screen printing press and I'm making these t-shirts. I learned how to code. I built my own website. Damn. I called my parents. It's like, wait, somebody in the dorm who's my age has their own business. Is this real? And they're like, yeah, you could do that. I was like, what are you talking about? Like, I, it did not occur to me. Mm. And so from that point on, I was like, I can build my own business. And if I do that, I can actually build the company that I want to work at and be mm -hmm. a part of, right? Like we've all experienced different cultures in our life. Like imagine you were on a sports team with a really bad culture. There was a mean coach or players didn't get along. Like that's an unhealthy culture and it's terrible. Now think of something you were in that was really great. A sports team with a great culture. Everyone's cheering everyone on. Come on in, Marie, you can run faster. Or let's all wake up early together and yeah, train. Inspire each other. Let's all do a study group together. And there's, wow, like this feels really good. And mm -hmm. so when you build your own business, you get to make your own culture. And I think this is something that I realized pretty early on, like, wow, I can really, like when I played tennis in college, my team had some people who were not very nice. Mm -hmm. And so it kind of made it miserable. And I realized later on, like, wow, imagine if I could make my own team, I could really only have nice people. Mm. Then it would be really fun. Yeah. So I set off on this journey, like build my own business. And, you know, I had to, you know, suddenly start reaching out and making new friends and learning how to, you know, be myself and, be, you know, become socially calibrated. And I think, you know, to your first question about, you know, what was it like when I met Bill Clinton? like that first time and like what was the experience that we talked about in the book it's just like from those early events i was just on the phone calling people come on you know let's go and everyone kind of came to the early events i think from my excitement mm -hmm. or you know my other co-founders excitement but as we started you know growing up we started you know asking more questions being more thoughtful being more pragmatic and people actually went from just thinking, oh, wow, they're good energetic event organizers to, wow, these are actually really likable people that we could mm -hmm. be friends with. And so it was, you know, a couple of years in and Bill Clinton spoke at our event and there I was, I'd gone from basically somebody who could barely put an event together to, you know, welcoming him on stage and, um, you know, being in front of, you know, a thousand people at this event. And, um, I think it was like the confluence of all the experiences we had that mm -hmm. now we were mature enough to actually welcome a former president and what that meant. We were, you know, we had built infrastructure to, you know, support his security teams and his security protocols. And we had, were able to, you know, organize an event that was logistically, you know, very complex that could have a thousand people and we had a PR, you know, team and we could have, um, you know, media attend. And mm. I think there we were like just a few years later realizing like, wow, we created all this. And at the end of the day, it's, it's all about, it was all about like building our own team and our own culture. Yeah. So you went to the university of Wisconsin. Yes. And you say that you were inspired by the people coming back because you didn't want that to be your future. I was scared. I was you were scared. freaking out. <laughs> And you have in your book that, you know, you're walking and you were super inspired by all the students around you, the energy, but then you turn around and then you realize like, if I want to be kind of exceptional or do something different, I need to be walking a different path, like symbolically, like walking against the flow because it requires a lot of confidence to actually pursue your own dreams. Do you think that, where did that come from? And was it kind of just like seeing your idols and being scared that you didn't want to take that path or is there something kind of more required inside of you? Well, college is a great time or when you're living with your parents to try to build anything because there, there's not a huge, you know, downfall if you mm -hmm. mess up and your, you know, YouTube channel doesn't work, your drop shipping idea doesn't work or, you know, whatever, you know, your new podcast doesn't work like you're just back in college. So mm -hmm. po college is like a really great place. Or now when p kids are 15, 16, 17 at home to mm -hmm. try things. Uh, like that experience I had 
was every day I would walk to school and I'd walk to class and there's like, it felt like 10,000 kids or 6,000 kids all walking to that 9 a.m. or 8 a.m. class together. I mean, it was thousands of kids and it was, it felt inspiring and you could, you know, the energy of all the students together going to those classes, everyone going to learn. And I did it every single day and I, I really loved it. And when I got to the beginning of my junior year, I was walking one day and I just realized like I, I, I turned around in the middle of my walk and I looked back into the sea of faces and I could see these thousands of kids like continuing to walk by me. And I think it's like in that moment, I realized like these are all amazing people, but they're all going in the exact same direction they're all gonna have the same degrees and the same diplomas and they're gonna have learned the same things from the same university. And the University of Wisconsin, as good as it is, it's not you know, like it's Stanford. It's not like a top 10 school. It's not a top 30 school. It's not a top 50 school. And also this is just this year. Mm -hmm. So it's like there's just millions and millions of people doing the same thing at even better schools. And mm -hmm. if I go and do the same thing, I know what my future is going to hold. I'm going to go to the same job fairs, competing for the same jobs, applying for the same startup positions. And and then you're going to end up like the guys on the tennis team. And I'm going to end up like the guys <laughs> on the tennis team. This is what it felt like to yeah. me in that moment and then the weeks after and the months after as I, as I kind of pondered it. I actually don't think it took me months. It took me like a week of just like, oh my God. Like, like this is what's going to happen. Like yeah. I will get a job. I will survive, but it's not going to be fun. And I'm going to be in this system. And this is not to say that college is not a really great place to mm -hmm. be because I really love college, but college is a place to really learn and not get put into the monotony of just going through the motions like, oh, yeah, I'm getting my credits and I got 15 credits this semester and did these classes because I had to. Like as soon as I got to college, met the kid who was an entrepreneur, I was going at it trying to start a business. Like I was pulling all nighters, like two or three nights a week, mm. trying to build businesses. And I was just like learning, learning, mm. learning, teaching myself everything. Um, and so when I realized that, that wow, I don't want to just be like everyone else, I realized like the most important thing is at least I'm going to be different. Mm. And so I literally turned around and I walked back through the crowd of kids and I saw them all going one way and I said, look, like I might not succeed, but at least if I ever have to apply for a job, I'm going to tell them like, I am not like all these other people. So yeah. you may reject me on the spot or you may think, wow, okay, well, let's hear about this, you know, one kid who's the black sheep. I love the symbolism of just walking against the crowd. It's real. It yeah. happened. I had a similar, I guess, experience when I was at USC and I took a leave of absence, but not to pursue like a business full time. I worked at what I thought would be my dream job at like my dream company, which is like marketing at Neutrogena. And I did like one hour of real work a day. And then for the rest of the time, just sat at a desk and they, I think they loved me. And I was like, wow, this is going to be my future after I graduate. And so... I remember I was, you know, part of this like select group in the business school called like GLP and our dean came and we all were at a luncheon and he was going around the tables asking where everyone was going to work after they graduated. And I had decided to pursue starting this company called Shutter with my friend Shelby, who was also a YouTuber. And we had the exact same idea and we realized it when we met at this creator event. And I remember literally avoiding the dean because everyone was like, I'm going to work at Deutsche Bank, McKinsey, like all of these really KPMG and accounting, like all these super impressive, very traditional career paths. And you said at the time when you were kind of graduating, that was like the start. Maybe that was after the startup era. But, you know, similarly, people had these very traditional yeah. career paths. <laughs> um, and so you dropped out of college you decided you're going to take a leave of absence to try to pursue. Yeah, I think a semester off is a very thoughtful way to explore your dreams. And again, I started my dreams in college. Mm -hmm. My first two startups failed in college. Like I took most of freshman year for one, most of sophomore year for another. Mm -hmm. So you started immediately in college. Like the first month of second semester freshman year, mm -hmm. the second half of freshman year. Yeah. And then so two startups didn't work. So by junior year, I, the summer before junior, I started a third business, 
and I was over two, and that was with my dad, and it was his first, you know, real business that he'd started. We became business partners. Mm. He started it before me, and he was a writer, so it was like an email newsletter company, and I became the advertising um, salesperson. Yeah. And that's where you had an office by the White House. And so you leveraged the address, which was... Yeah, the White House is at 1600 Pennsylvania. And we rented this terrible office space at 1601 Pennsylvania Avenue. It's literally, it was, it was a Regis shared workspace. And we got an interior office. But I was literally next to the White House. And I think, like, I could feel the energy when I showed up in the morning. I'd, like go grab a sandwich from a nearby cafe every day and like eat my sandwich as I walked literally on Pennsylvania Avenue past the White House and just feel the energy of like being in the center of, you know, all the action. Yeah. And I would tell people, yeah, we're at our headquarters here at 1601 Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, <laughs> but yes, yes, I, I moved, I left college for my semester off. I moved back into my childhood bedroom. We got this little office space right downtown, which, you know, I also, you know, needed the office space to be, you know, popping around town and taking the subway everywhere and trying to go to meetings. Yeah. And I got after it. You speak a lot about energy and feeling the energy in places. Is that just like kind of a thing that you enjoy or is that like a spiritual thing or is that just kind it's of? It's not spiritual. Yeah. I think you can just feel, you can use a different word, but mm -hmm. I mean, it's just like when you're around people who are really negative. Yeah, oh, okay. And they look at you like you're nothing and like you'll never achieve anything. Mm -hmm. You can just feel, I don't even have to use the word energy, you can just yeah. feel there. They won't give you the time of day. Yeah, it just could be old friends, family members. It could just, you can feel their skepticism at how stupid it is what you're doing. Mm. How dumb your YouTube ideas are and like, yeah, just we all know what that's like to have people who use these like mean spirited words and they chide us and they're very they're sarcastic but not in a nice way and just everything it has an undertone of like you're never going to succeed. Yeah, you describe yourself as the epitome of clueless, but you had really good intentions, you just didn't have any idea like earlier on. And there was yeah, and so there were a lot of people that showed up with like didn't, didn't, were not supportive. Yeah. And I think it's important to surround yourself with people who say, who see, you know, you and them and they say, wow, you know, Elliot or Anne Marie, they have a great, they have a, you know, they have a good attitude. They're working hard. They're great listeners. They're great learners. Yeah. They're a little bit clueless and taking a lot of missteps, but you know what, this is, they're on the path yeah. and I'm going to help them and I'm going to support them. And you know, that's the opposite of that really negative mean spirited energy that will just hold you back forever. And I think like one of the most important things people need to do is extricate and leave the negative energy, the mm. negative people. Like you yeah. need to leave, it would be better to sleep on the couch or the floor in a roll of blankets of you know somebody who loves you and supports you and believes in you than have agree. the golden handcuffs of you know living at a beautiful house your family has but you know they don't want you to follow your dreams to be a musician and yeah. every time you try to do that they you know whether they say it or you can feel it they think it's a waste of time and i think even afterwards it takes like a while to get that toxicity out of your system and kind of start to believe in yourself again it's just like when you're around people who are really negative yeah oh, okay and they look at you like you're nothing and like you'll never achieve anything mm -hmm. you can just feel I don't even have to use the word energy. You can just yeah. feel there. They won't give you the time of day. Yeah, it just could be old friends, family members. It could just, you can feel their skepticism at how stupid it is what you're doing, mm. how dumb your YouTube ideas are. And like, yeah, just we all know what that's like to have people who use these like mean-spirited words and they chide us and they're very, they're sarcastic, but not in a nice way. And just everything it has an undertone of like, you're never going to succeed. Yeah, exactly. So, you you know, I had a, was very lucky. I had extremely supportive parents, but mm -hmm. I've just been really proactive, you know, about you are the sum of the five people you spend the most time around. And like, okay, so who are those people? Honestly assess. And, you know, look, going back to your question about the team, the best part of building a startup or building your, your dream, in my opinion, because I am not somebody who just, you know, 
goes to a corner by myself and writes a book or has big ideas or works by myself, like the best part above the customer, above the clients, like the absolute best part for me is the team. Yeah. Like, and that is, it's similar to like loving yourself. It's like just loving the people that you work with. Yeah. And like, that is what makes it fun. And, and by the way, that is how you serve your customers or your subscribers or your readers or your clients is that like, you have to make something for those people. Mm. Like that, that's what any business is. You make a product or a service for your customers. So the people you make that product or service with, like that is what you spend all your time on. And for me, that's the best part. Like showing up with this group of people yeah. who are completely in the trenches with you, aligned with you, yeah. love you, support you, and like you all love each other and are supporting each other like a, a great team. So from reading the book, it kind of just sounds like you found this group of people that were amazing and then it, you were just in it all together. But how, or is there like a secret thing that you looked for? What were the green flags in those, in those people that you knew that they were for the group, they would build together, you know, they'd be in it for the group, not just like for themselves. And how did you kind of know and trust that that was the case? Well, I feel like business partners, it's similar to relationships. Like you can't change someone you're in a relationship with and you shouldn't try to. And, you know, people just are who they are. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we can all improve around the edges, you know, but our core personality type, like that is who we are. And so, you know, you want to make sure that people have the same, you know, not just vision as you, but also, also the same values along the way. Mm -hmm. Like, is money the most important thing to them? Mm. You know, is obsession around design important or are they willing to, you know, make some sacrifices to keep the product moving along? You know, are they, you know, do they, do they put other people before them or are they always wanting like the big mm. title? Yeah. You know, are they in it for the, the love of doing it and the impact or is it for them about, you know, ego and power, mm. you know? And so I think without saying there's right or wrong answers, there's right or wrong answers for each of us. Mm. And so I think we need to identify what our values are. You know, if you're an obsessive designer or artist, it may be that you only want to have partners who are also obsessive designers. Mm. So I think you set your vision, you set your values. What do you care about? What do you want to build? And then I think we were really lucky with like the original Summit founders. Yeah. Um, but then also the best way to bring people onto a team is to create something that people want to self-select into. So mm. if they see, oh, this is how they're living, they're waking up early, they're having healthy superfood smoothies, they're, they really are dedicated to a community. They're all not taking big salaries. They're living in a shared house together. Um, nobody has any titles. Um, only a certain type of persons will want to self-select into that group. Culture is like the most important thing because that's, you know, who you'll attract, what you'll put out. And something that's really important to you is like the double bottom line, not just like earning a bunch of money, but also doing good while you're at it, which is something that I really admire in companies and try to do even for content creation. It's like, if you're working with other brands, it's like, is that a good brand that's also doing kind of the same thing or another creator? Because if you're putting a creator on your page, you're kind of promoting them as a person too. So there's kind of a lot that goes into it, but self-selecting is super interesting to me. And you said that you could even kind of do that in the invitation or the event schedule by putting something like the discussion on death or whatever, you yes. know, just having events and topics that are very, that are for very open people who want to connect with others. Right, like we would schedule a 1 a.m. talk and conversation around, you know, death and, you know, how you, you know, want to, you know, show up for others in their final days, like your parents. Like we would mm. schedule these deep talks and then you can bet that at 1 a.m. the people who go to those talks are different than the people who are going to see, you know, Swedish House, Swedish House Mafia at 1 a.m. Um, right, for like <laughs> late night music. So I think, and it's, you know, you know, the people going to the breathwork session at, you know, 7.30 in the morning on a Saturday, it's gonna, people are gonna self-select into that who 
you know, there's not a right or wrong again, but if, if that's what you want, you know, that's going to attract a certain person, you know, when there's a 9am morning run for six miles, um, there's certain people that are going to self select into that run. And so you can bring together people who have shared values and you can start to find your tribe. Like if you're very intellectual and you live in Manhattan, the best way to meet other intellectual people would be to maybe go to the chess club three times a week. Mm -hmm. Or if you want to meet people in Manhattan, you know, and you're into food, maybe go to the farmer's markets and actually get to know, get to know the vendors. Right. And so I'm very into mm -hmm. kind of knowing what your interests are and then self-selecting into, you know, shared interest groups. So when you had your early events and you were inviting all these people and then something that I really loved about Creator Camp, when they pitched it to me, they were like, we want to invite people that we would have over to our parents' house for dinner. dinner. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, that's adorable. And then I read that in your book. That's <laughs> so how do you go about in early stages, like finding the people that will kind of like self-select into these events? Well, if you want to build community, I mean, you, you should really start very small. Mm -hmm. You know, you can just start with dinner parties and these are not, these should never be like cater dinner parties. They shouldn't be dinner parties at fancy restaurants. They should always be at your house, in your home. Mm -hmm. You should, you know, create a space. Um, and you should invite people to come cook. Mm. We, we had a, a, a chef, Michael Hebb once who, you know, he has mentored us a lot over the years, but one thing he did was host a dinner for us. And he said, all right, I want, everyone to be ready for eight o'clock dinner at five o'clock at the house. Wow. Okay. So we got, he showed up and he said, all right, we're going to, he walked the house. He like cased the property. He found a, he found a bow, he found a balcony and he said, all right, I want you to bring like these three coffee tables mm -hmm. up here. Okay. He said, I want you to bring all these couch cushions and put them around the table. Mm -hmm. I want you to get the lamps from the house and put them in this way. And then he had us all help. Some people were cooking, preparing. Wow. And then when it got dark, here we were sitting, it felt like a Moroccan style yeah. vibes and feast. He had a certain music and everything was only on a balcony with these lamps sitting on the floor with our legs crossed at these coffee tables, eating the food we all prepared. I think that's like the beauty of creating a culture where it's about the community because then you have like someone like Michael who's like, oh, I have this idea and he probably knows best like how to enjoy food in a shared space. And so he created this environment like for you guys. So it's not just like you for having to do everything on your own. You actually get the help from everyone then because that's your culture. Yes. Yeah, so then we would started building on that and we would have we would when we would do dinners and again you can start with six people eight people we would say you know we'd love to ask uh Anne marie will you make the toast and so we would kind of spontaneously mm. call on people to make the toast we would have often like t a topic yeah. and we would encourage everyone to have a one table conversation mm. not like little side conversation i'm sure you've been at like some beautiful restaurant yeah. with 12 friends and then it's like there's no cohesiveness to yeah, it yeah. there's just like you're at this beautiful restaurant everyone spent all this money you finish the dinner, everyone had just a side conversation with the person on each side of them, everyone overpaid, no one feels cohesive. Yeah. So this is the opposite. We would have table conversations. We would l compassionately listen. We, we might ask questions like, if you just found out you were gonna die in 30 days, what would you do in the final 30 days? Or what is something that you believe that almost nobody else believes in the world? Mm -hmm. Like we would add, and then we would go around asking provocative questions or like when we did a toast, we would clink the person next to us and then pass it around. And you would like, I would clink your glass. You would clink the person next to you. You would watch the toast get like passed around. Yeah. So we were just doing these things that were bringing the room together. And then at the end, we would have everyone bring their own plates and dishes. And these are like, like high that. powered people like into that. the kitchen. <laughs> We would say, would anyone like to help us do the dishes? It reminds me at the end of the movie Ratatouille, there's like this mm. really grumpy <laughs> guy who rev who's like the, the chief reviewer of Michelin or whatever he is. But when he gets served the final meal, which is the Ratatouille, he cries because that was the dish his mother served him. Yeah. And I think there's an element of, you know, everyone's done the dishes. It doesn't matter how successful you are. And so a lot of times, like the more successful people, now everything's done for them. So yeah, when they expect we would, it. Now we tell people, hey, come early. You're welcome to come and join us for cooking. 
you know, everyone's now sharing and listening at the tables. Yeah. Everyone's bringing their plates to the kitchen. It just, the whole th dinners feel so communal. Mm. And, and very open too. Very open. Yeah. So I was at a content house, my content house, and we were throwing like our first like housewarming party. party. And my sister, who's like a year older than me, I'm like very naturally introverted. She's the most extroverted person I know. So I've like modeled a lot of my social skills off of her growing up. And she came in to our house and she was like, you know, we had a bunch of like influencers come kind of like influencers, you know, sometimes have egos or, you know, they are, they go into a space and often you can go to an influencer event and it's really uncomfortable or awkward because no one's actually talking to each other. They're all just like staying in their own spaces. And she wanted us, she actually made us do an icebreaker. And at first everyone was super uncomfortable. No one wanted to do the icebreaker. It's like 30 people standing in a giant circle. We're talking about, you know, where are you from, your name, and maybe like your Zodiac or some question. I think you mentioned somewhere that icebreakers are super important. And it sounds like even, you know, creating the box of like, okay, this is your box that you need to clean up. This is your dish. You come and do it. Making people like a little bit uncomfortable to be comfortable and a part of the entire group. How do you go about doing that in a way? Maybe also you, we talked about, you know, you had to be socially calibrated. So you're just more excited as a person, you have good intentions. And maybe that just translates to like, maybe an uncomfortable icebreaker where it's okay to be uncomfortable for a little I while. I mean, icebreakers can be so awkward. Yeah. So I feel <laughs> your pain and the tension. Um, it ended up being the best for the yes. group because everyone after that, I'm not sure that everyone, everyone was very cohesive. You could go around the room and talk to anyone where I'm not sure that that would have happened if we hadn't done that icebreaker, honestly. Yeah. I mean, the reality is when you have, you know, people in a room who've never met and even if it's eight or 10 people for dinner, mm -hmm. You know, I, I prefer to do less awkward things. I can just, it's just painful to feel the awkwardness. <laughs> yeah. But I think when you have people who've never met, taking the time in as least an awkward way as possible to mm -hmm. have a, you, you really need to have a group conversation and to just, you know, share, you know, share, hey, let's pause and just so we know who everyone is, you know, go around and share. And, and often we'll, you know, we'll, ask questions um we always joke that like the worst kind of relationship is a reporting relationship where it's like and marie how are you You're like i'm good i'm good and how's the weather in new york like, yeah. it's, it's been really nice elliot thank you and i'm like <laughs> and how are things here house like yeah it's you know it's it's okay um so the key is like asking deep questions like what was the um the hardest thing you went through this week mm. and what was your biggest win of the week you know, you could do an icebreaker like that, or just in general, even when I'm trying to talk to people or when we get our team together. I mean, I think just, it really starts with asking deep, deepening and thoughtful questions, even like that. You know, what was the hardest thing you went through this week and what was your biggest win? So it gives someone a chance to kind of let something out and gives them a chance to like share what they were most excited about. And you give everyone 90 seconds. So, you know, nobody's rambling on and then there's you know not like a 10 minute sob story mm. do you prepare those beforehand or do you just kind of like read the energy of the room and you've done this so many times where you're just like i know the right questions to ask i tend to think the best interviews and the best questions come from listening to people feeling how they are feeling what the group the group is like and then asking a question that you're genuinely would like to know the answer to mm. Yeah, you could even say like, you know, what's the worst living situation you've ever had? And then um, who, you know, what what's something, um, who's uh, your, you know, a mentor you've been meaning to thank? Or what's the most powerful lesson you learned from each of your parents? Mm -hmm. So I, I tend to not like to prepare mm. questions or conversations that are by nature supposed to be deep. Mm. that because it, it you can just feel the lack of authenticity generally yeah that's interesting because i feel like i'm kind of more of a very go with the flow person and so when i was first hosting my events for the alaska tourism industry association i didn't really plan that much but i think that also allows kind of you know you can take advantage of whatever's happening in the moment or you you don't always have to have like a super planned out schedule. And even for like podcasting, I think it's, you can over prepare in a way. And 
I think you also mentioned in your book that you need to plan for kind of nothing or have have a schedule for just nothing to happen. Yeah, you can you can prepare a space at the beginning of your dinner of 20 minutes where you're going to ask, you know, two questions to each person. Right? Or you can prepare in your podcast that over an hour I want to have three sections of 20 minutes each. Mm-hmm. And this is the theme of the section. So if one section's going off the rails cuz you know, somebody's rambling around about a political issue, you can you can shift topics to a different theme you want to get to. But yes, I think the idea of just like having all the questions written down, like all good conversations. And if you think of, you know, a really great date that you've been on or a great meal you've had with someone we had the best conversation, you didn't each show up with a list of 10 questions. Mm-hmm. Like you deeply and compassionately listened to the other person. You actually heard what their struggles were, what they're excited about, and then you built on top of that. Wow, you're really excited about like that you just moved to this, you know, to this new city. Well, what what is it actually like in that city, and why did you make that move? And you know, or oh, you're this is happening with a certain friend of yours. Like, well, tell me the backstory there. So all all good conversations are a result of both the people deeply and compassionately listening to the others and then asking deepening and thoughtful questions. I like that. Yeah. Okay, so in Creator Camp as well, something that I thought was really unique was the keep it surreal. Mm. So what does that mean? Okay, so (laughs) going back to this chef, Michael Hebb, and he's so much more than that, Mm -hmm. but that's kind of how we got his start. (laughs) When we met the first time, we were having a dinner, and he was asking us lots of questions about our events. And he said, let me ask you a question with your, you know, your new events you're putting on at Summit. Do you guys keep it real, would you say? And we're like, yeah, obviously we keep it real, the most real. And he's like, you keep it real? I'm like, yeah, of course. <laughs> he's like, well, it's a big effing problem because everybody keeps it real these days. You need to keep it surreal. If you don't make everything you do stand out surreal and different nobody's ever going to pay attention to what you're doing it's and um and this is like 12 years ago what does surreal mean to you it means um over the top and Mm. mind-blowing but i guess anyone could have their interpretation but i think in anything we do you know it has to gain attention and i think look we live in a very attention-driven, attention-seeking world. So I think in a way it's kind of obvious now. But, you know, I think events, there's certain industries that are still not caught up Mm. with the maximizing attention and, you know, surrealness, right? Like you could say content is like just pushing over the top. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you could still say events are, you know, they're not that, wild. They're not that over the top. I mean, we were doing business events and having, you know, encouraging people to go skydiving on the first or second day, right? Which was like insane. They would have all these business people going to a business conference and encouraging them to go skydiving. Or we were doing our programming for 72 straight hours and it never stopped, but they were going to a business conference. You know, normally the talks start at 8 a.m. and end at 4. And, you know, our talks were, you know, you know, going until 2 in the morning or 3 in the morning. Right. And so, you know, we made a rule of no VIP rooms. Like the worst thing is when you Mm. finally get into a cool venue and then there's like a VIP section and another VIP section. And uh, we made a rule, no VIP, no backstage. Mm. You know, once you're in, everybody's the same. Mm. So I think just doing things that, you know, make it different, make it special, make people feel part of a community. And that's cool, too, because it goes back to your values of like, you know, kind of no one is better no one has like the title it's a very equal level playing field in which like you want people to be open to each other yes very interesting you mentioned for your group dynamics because it sounds like uh you know you have a team that you build with no man left behind in terms of personal growth and experiences do you actively have to check in on your team your group like the core four or how do you ensure that you're doing that 
and that everyone's happy. Okay, so it's, you know, it's been more than 12 years since we started Summit, so it shifted a lot, but mm -hmm. I think the most relatable days were the early days when it started with just four people, and then over a few years we built it, the team to about 20 people. Mm -hmm. And I've always enjoyed companies that are under 30 people, under 40 at the most, because mm -hmm. once you get over that, you start to have like, you can't know everybody really well. Yeah, and you it's have a bureaucracy at that point. Yeah, there's multiple layers of management, and I just, I've really enjoyed smaller teams. Mm -hmm. So when we started, we really, you know, wanted to build something lean and mean, um, where we knew every, you know, we could personally interview everyone. It wasn't like, oh, you know, the, that department, I didn't have a chance to even meet them or I met them for 15 minutes. I mean, look, I get it. Companies have thousands of people or Tesla's got a hundred thousand or whatever. But for me, like we just enjoyed small teams and interviewing everyone, knowing everyone, if, you know, someone had challenges, you know, we could personally sit with them. Like we were really putting in the time with everyone, mentoring everyone. They could communicate to everyone could communicate directly to the leadership. Mm. It's not like, oh, I don't have access to these, to these folks. And yeah, we we're really passionate about, you know, the quality of life of everyone on the team. Mm. Um, we did team trips where everyone at the company would come up, you know, could have the option to come on the trip, which they did. Um, we went sail. We went sailing one year. Like mm -hmm. it was, it was just really fun. Like we, we loved the team, and it felt like everyone was, you know, everyone loved the mission, which was building community. And so it felt like every time we sell a ticket to an event, we are, you know, that's another person who's going to be impacted by come, being part of this community and impacted by coming to the event. So. It just felt very aligned, like the programming team, the content team, whether you're booking speakers or booking music or designing menus or, you know, booking theaters or booking the next events. Like everyone was like fully on board and energized to, you know, build this epic event, build this community and, you know, support each other, you know, any way that they could. It sounds like this is like inspiring to me because it sounds like you just have a culture in which you do look out for everyone and you can, you know, kind of have it, have everything kind of both worlds. Was there a point in time where you're just like, this is not gonna work. Like we're like this way that we're doing this is not working. Like, well, I would say the thing that's always been hard is the making money part, because if you're really focused on the product, you want to be very thoughtful with how you invest into the community and the events. And so, you know, we weren't just selling some flimsy tech product at the biggest margins we could, you know, we weren't just, you know, pitching one type of event and having people show up and it was something totally different. Like if you ask any of the tens of thousands of people who've come to summit, like one thing everyone will say is, they went over the top, like mm -hmm. the amount of programming and speakers and music and content, the quality of everything, you know, people, you know, may say, Oh, the event wasn't for me, or it was whatever it was, you know, too much action, or I didn't like the location or whatever, you know, there's a long line of check in whatever it is, but yeah. but everyone will say like, that was over the top in terms of like, how much we delivered. And you know, I think since we cared about the community, right, we didn't just build a random community of people we don't like. Mm -hmm. It was a community of people we admire, revered, looked up to. So we went over the top, investing into the community, investing into the events. And, you know, so it's always been hard then to find the balance of how do you pay your team in a way where they're excited about their compensation and, you yeah. know, don't get recruited away. Now, having a powerful mission where they can work um, building this epic event rather than at kind of like a soulless bureaucratic, you know, company mm -hmm. will help. But, you know, if they get offered twice as much and they have a family, like they got to do what they got to do. So I think like being able to pay everyone, you know, in a way that felt really good for them and mm -hmm. was, you know, commensurate with the market and then, you know, being able to, you know, make enough profit that we had money in the bank to invest in the next events because events you're always having to, like, you know, put deposits down ahead of time. Yeah. Like we have an event 
say in a year from now, like we've already made deposits, mm -hmm. even though we haven't sold tickets. So you can have like cash flow issues. So that's always been the biggest challenge. Like once mm -hmm. we built events, they, you know, people really resonated with them. I think, I think also picking the right locations that people were excited to go to. Like mm. people always resonated with Summit at Sea, they resonated with Summit Tulum, they resonate right now with Summit Palm Desert because it's near Los Angeles, but it's in this beautiful place, Palm mm -hmm. Springs. So I think picking uh, locations and then just the actual production of hundreds and hundreds of people producing and executing, you know, a massive three day event. So I think that there are a lot of creators who really care about the community and kind of the art that they're putting out. But that's the major problem that I'm seeing is like, especially even at like creator camp, it was like people are very much picked for the culture of building this community and whatever art they're putting out and like storytelling. What kind of advice would you give to people who are doing what they love, are passionate and are living their truth in whatever they do, but maybe are not making the connection with like money, but a lot of them believe that eventually the money will come around, but it's hard in the moment. Do you have any advice for those types of people? Because on YouTube, you can just, you know, you get opportunities, you can take any brand deal and you can kind of make a lot of money, but it might not be something that you actually use or something that you're proud yeah, of there's promoting. There's this, uh, all the creators will like it. There's this Andy Warhol quote. You should look up the quote yeah, while we're yeah, here. Okay. Look, look up the quote um, and then we can say it. It's uh, is look up Andy Warhol business oh, money quote. Being good in business is the most fascinating kind of art. Making money is art and working is art and good business is the best art. Hmm. Yeah, that quote really resonated with me over the years because I think as an artist, you kind of shun money. Yeah, that's And so then when I do. heard that quote, like read the quote slowly again. Being good in business is the most fascinating kind of art. Making money is art and working is art and good business is the best art. That is very relevant, I think, to the creator space as well. Yeah, it kind of, because we kind of viewed Summit as art. Yeah. We viewed it as like social sculptures, mm. like, and viewed ourselves as artists creating events. And then it's like, okay, well, monetizing your events or your community is something you have to tread extremely lightly on, because mm. they're not just customers, they're a community, and so, it's the same thing as monetizing a community. So many customer bases are communities, all the subscribers of a YouTube channel, like yeah, they're a real community. Totally. And so I think like reframing, like making money as art in itself, hmm. like it really takes a lot of thought process. It's not just like, ah, oh, here's three options, get yeah. these sponsors or do this. It's like, it's art and you need to brainstorm and think, okay, what can serve my community? whether it's products I make or, um, you know, what will the community be excited about? That is a very beautiful way to think about it because I have seen a lot of artists, they think like money is the root of all evils, but you really can do it in a way that serves your community and kind of gives you more credibility and people want to support their favorite creator. And you're not gonna figure it out in a month. No. Like if you really yeah. view making money as art, it's gonna take as long to figure it out as writing a book. Hmm. Like this isn't something like, oh, you know, it's so hard to make money. Yes, of course it's hard. Like if you don't care about the community, it's a lot easier. But if you really care, it's gonna take years and years, but you can figure it out and you can do something that really does serve the community and everybody can win. And you know, you can create your own mindset, like profit enough. Mm -hmm. You know, not, yeah. it doesn't have to be about maximizing profit. You can do it in a, if your community is against making money, you can be transparent with them and share your expenses. I mean, mm. there's so, and there's so many people who figured this out really well, whether it's through their Patreons or yeah. certain, you know, launching restaurants, you know, not maybe, it, you know, it's like not monetizing their fans for watching their content, but having another offering, like they mm. can go to Mr. Beast Burger, whatever, whatever it is, yeah. there, there's so many thoughtful ways and i i think that that reframe was very helpful that is a beautiful quote like i really like that <laughs> quote i feel like that is actually so important especially for creators so you talk a lot about that seems to be an overarching theme is just like patience you know good things take time yes and you have your i think you said for your short-term goals even it's not like 
because I mean, I'm surrounded by like a lot of like 22 year old boys and they're like, how do I make the most amount of money in the shortest amount of time? And your short, ter- short term, you said it was like one to two years. Yeah, yeah, that's short term, yes. Yeah, which I agree. So um, can you just talk more maybe on patience or what your thoughts are? Okay, yeah, well, it's impossible to do anything successfully within five years. That's just, it's just not, it's almost impossible. I love that. (laughs) So I've tried to break things into one to two year goals, which would be short term, Um, medium term, which would be like two to five years, and then long term, which would be, you know, five to 15 years. And the long term feels so far away, but it's really, it's really not, you know, Mm -hmm. especially if you're going to, you know, buy a house and, you know, turn it into an Airbnb, like you're really going to start crushing it in year three. And I hope you don't shut it down in year five Yeah. because, you know, now, but you know, at that point, the property is appreciating and it's cash flowing. So I think whatever it is, your YouTube channel, like not you're not going to have any subscribers the first couple of years. Yeah, I've been on YouTube for 10 years. You even mentioned relationships. Those take a really long time too. Like nurturing those relationships. Exactly. All these things take a decade. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, now is when you're coming into the, you know, glory days of your YouTube channel if you have, you know, 10 years worth of subscribers. And so it takes a long time. And the more we can kind of plan ahead for that, you know, whether you're investing, like no startup is sending you money, like it's not getting sold or going public for seven to 10 years or more sometimes. Yeah, it's all kind of like compounding upon each other, whether it's like relationships, your work, the trust that you have and the people that attend your events. There's a compounding effect to everything, whether it's like you said, you know, the obvious compounding, you know, analogy is is money that compounds and nothing you can barely notice the compounding uh, in a few years or five or 10 years. But in year like 20, 30, 40, it's exponential. Mm-hmm. But then relationships and hard work, it really does compound. So just setting your goals and thinking like, what, you know, what do I want to, you know, well, what do I want to accomplish in, you know, these next this next year or two? But like, how do I want that to set me up for five years and 10 years from now? Yeah, I love that. Okay, um, to wrap, a few questions left. So I had a friend who ended up being like in this creator house with me. His name is Elliot as well, actually. And when I met him, I met him at a YouTube event. It was like this NBC, like college influencers event. And we met and then I was just like, okay, I'll probably whatever, never see him again unless I'm in the same city. And he started FaceTiming me all the time. And I was like, who is this person who I barely know who is FaceTiming me? But then you said, you mentioned, I think in a podcast that you also like to communicate through FaceTime. Is there a reason for that? Or do you have any like kind of tips to just keep up with people that you are not super close with, but that you want to develop this long-term relationship with? Hopefully his FaceTime calls were... I thought they were weird at first, but that's how we became really good friends. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I try not to just FaceTime random people that I just met. Um, But yes, look, I think especially because there's so many interesting people not in your city. Mm -hmm. It's just infinitely easier to have conversations with people over video chat. Mm -hmm. So, you know, look, if I'm going to have like a long, more focused conversation, it doesn't have to be on FaceTime. But I think it's really powerful way to stay in touch with my friends. Like I I, and most of my friends don't live where I am. Mm -hmm. So I prefer to FaceTime them. Yeah, it's just more like first is in person. I love it. I think it's really fun. Or WhatsApp video. Yeah. Yeah, it's fine. (laughs) Okay, so I guess my last question is, I'm a big fan of like Naval Ravikant. He says like the, I don't know if you know, he's like a very thoughtful. Yeah, of course. Yeah, Yeah, so he says like the most important, three most important things are like who you're working with, what you're working on, and where you live. So you are based in Miami. is And Powder Mountain. Okay. yeah. For, can you kind of give an explanation of like why you chose like both of those locations? Obviously Powder Mountain is the mountain that you own with your summit group, but for Miami, why did you choose Miami? Well, my wife is from Miami. Okay. All the grandparents are here. Our kid goes to school here. Mm -hmm. I love tropical weather. Uh, Look, I tend to think that all the, every city in town has really great people you can find really great restaurants really great scenes so i can pretty much 
thrive anywhere. Mm -hmm. But I also, you know, we've been coming to Miami for 10 years. Like I like, you know, finding a base and, you know, I don't love the transient lifestyle of yeah. like, oh, I'm not sure where I live and I'm thinking of this new place. Like I think if I look at all the people I really admire, like they really, you know, dug into one place mm -hmm. and that's their place and they take care of that city or that town and, you know, they travel, but like they have a home. And I, I think as you get older, um, you really resonate with, you know, having a home and a, a place. Yeah. Yeah. Because I'm in Alaska right now and I'm like, I don't know if. You know, I, I love Alaskans. I think they're a very unique group of people, but I'm not sure that that's where I want to be long term just because it is a lot harder to get connected with the people that I want to be connected with. It's pretty far. It's very far. And it's also it's great to have people come. So yeah. like I still plan on like I think it's a great way to kind of get what people city are in you person. In? Anchorage. Wow. I've only been to Sitka. Oh, really? Why? Yeah. <laughs> we went and lived in the Tongass National Forest really? for a week. Wow. Was that a part of the summit group or no, no? I just I went with some friends. Well, we would do like different trips every summer, river yeah. rafting on the middle fork of the salmon or yeah. so. So yeah, we went to Alaska for a week. Yeah, and I've we, never been to Sitka, but I've heard it's like the most beautiful. It's more like southeast, so it's I guess similar it's to like Seattle. For everybody listening, it's close Alaska. You know, yeah. it's like the it's the Alaska <laughs> that's two hours flight from Seattle. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, not the four hours yeah. flight from Seattle. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I guess I would love to go to Anchorage in the summer. I mean, I, I, I know people who go up there to ski at Alieska. Yeah. Like, I would love to go. Yeah. I'm, I like it because I still plan on hosting like people to come to Alaska and usually Alaska kind of does its the job for me because it's so unique, especially in the winter. People have never experienced like the winter or even just like everywhere you look is beautiful. So I like it in terms of like, I do want to keep hosting people because I do think it helps build that relationship. But in terms of like living there long term, I'm like, I don't think I can do this. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you so thank much you. for Loved your time. Um, I think that this quote is the most beautiful takeaway for artists. And I think it'll actually be really helpful for at least my community Good. and people. Okay, I can't wait to see what they come back with, yeah. what they think of it. I yeah. Mean, I just read it somewhere, so I, and it, it hit me. So I'm excited, I would love to hear what everybody thinks of it, how yeah. it makes them feel, what you're they on agree social with media. or what they you're, disagree you with. No, just okay. I, I'm at summit is our handle on okay. socials. Okay. And then last question, what would be the ideal thing that you would hope people take away from this book? Because for me, it was the first time I read like building communities, like super important to me, but you have actually done it and you're kind of a success story. And I'm like, wow, that's something that I can look forward to and pursue. It's just a very relatable story. We're not geniuses. We didn't have a tech company that's impossible to understand. We, you know, built our dreams with our bare hands. So it's mm -hmm. it's kind of the every person's book. Yeah. If you have some passion, however little it is, um, how to take that little cooking passion or content creation passion or whatever it is, film passion, um, and kind of create your own dreams. This is our like really funny and easy to <laughs> easy to read yeah. book filled with you know all of our mistakes. Yeah, I read it in a weekend and it was a great read. Genuinely. That's awesome. Thank you. All right, well thank you so much Thanks. Elliot. Thanks. Loved it. Thank you.